You are now listening to The Sound of Sanity. The sound will continue for the duration of the program. Hey everybody, welcome to Sanity Shelves. The part of the show, or the episode of the show, where we talk about books that we've read. And my understanding is that... Or been reading. Or been reading, yes. Yes, that we don't have to have finished them. My name is Nathan. I'm your humble and obedient host. This is Sound of Sanity. That's Ben right there. Hello. Uh, We still need your support. Oh, well, we should introduce Jake, shouldn't we? Should. Just so eager to get people's support. It's Jake. He's the pastor who's the master of sanity right there. Yep. Hey. As of this recording, we've made about $8,000 of the 60 that we need to bring in. End of year. Yeah. Although we're recording like four episodes of Sound of Sanity in the same day. So. Yeah. This episode. Yeah. This may be two or three weeks in and all the numbers may have changed. Yeah, Lord willing, we are doing. They uh, certainly and hopefully have. Yeah. But in any case, I'm sure we could still use your support. So warhornmedia.com forward slash give. Also buy a, a couple copies of Jake's book, Who is Jesus? Available on Amazon or again at warhornmedia.com. Just click the books tab. Uh, any other business, gentlemen? No. no. All right. So we come to Sanity Shelves. Now, Jake, my understanding is you have a baker's dozen of books, if I'm right in thinking that baker's dozen is 13. That's right. I think that's right. I don't know. Yeah, it's been a while since we've done a Sanity Shelves, so it's just sort of accumulated. Ben, do you have books? Oh, I have books I'm in process in. I, I that's what the like show is. It's just, what are, what are you reading right now? What's yeah. going on? I mean, I'm reading one that Jake already read and that we've already talked about, which is um, Extreme Ownership. It's really fun, helpful. Makes me wish I'd listened to it years ago. Years ago. Months ago. It is the best book on uh, leadership that I've ever read. Not that I've read a lot of books on leadership, but it's just really good. Um, I like it. I It's the first one on my list, actually, because I reread it. I re- reread cool. it with, with Peter. So I just thought it would be good for him going into high school. Yeah. And uh, uh, we were going to the gym in the mornings and from the gym to school and stuff like that. So it was just all, some decent car time with him. So we've been listening to, to various things. So uh, we'll, we'll just, we'll, we'll do extreme ownership. And it was great. And um, it was great for him, I think. I think he's taken a lot of that book to heart. We've had some good conversations. I feel like he's really grown through it. And so. Cool. That's fantastic. Yeah, so it's really best, sweet. Best book on leadership. Great book for a 14-year-old boy. Is that how old Peter is now? Yeah, Peter's 14. But I think it's, I think it's just good for any, anybody in any kind of leadership position. Um, it's just a lot of common, uh, common grace wisdom on leadership uh, from a Navy SEAL. And the beauty of you know, a Navy SEAL in the kind of position that uh, Jocko Willink was in is that he's a man who's responsible for the lives of other men, right? Life and death are at stake in the work of Navy SEAL leadership. And so it all, you know, this is not just some hypothetical money, CEO, dollars and cents kind of thing. This is like, no, the decisions that you make as a, a Navy SEAL, you, you, your ability to lead men determines who lives and dies on the battlefield. And so there's a lot at stake and they take leadership very seriously. And uh, you got to be able to lead men into battle and be willing to risk their lives. And so you don't often, even in books on spiritual leadership or whatever, you don't sense uh, anybody has near as much awareness of the stakes, Mm -hmm. right? There's infinitely more at stake in uh, spiritual leadership as a pastor, as an elder, as a father than life or death. But uh, very few people carry that weight with them. But Jocko Willink is somebody because life and death itself are at stake. He carries that weight and it comes through and it's really well presented with lots of stories from battle and from uh, business consultation, both. So he tries to bridge, you know, he'll tell a battle story or something like that. And then he'll come around and make an application to business or something like that to say, hey, you know, this is not just a battlefield thing. But here's how it works applied in a, a a less intense corporate environment or something like that. And then that gives you a lot of tools to make application to, you know, your home um, or to your church or to your own business or to whatever leadership positions you find yourself in. I, I was as I was listening to it the other day 
first couple hours of it, I guess, I, I was thinking, man, in a lot of ways, I am still a fatalist at heart about taking responsibility for things. I think, well, if I fail or if something fails, you know, that's important to me. Yeah. What will be, will be. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know? Well, and there's grace and I'll try harder and stuff and other people will hopefully try harder. But, eh. And there's just a lot of that, I think, in our blood. Reformed Christians get accused of this kind of thing. Like, you're, you're not going to, you know, the hyper-Calvinism stuff, you're not going to go evangelize because you can't change people's hearts and God's election is firm and... Why try? Why do anything? Mm-hmm. But there's just the flavor of that in our lives and in our in our culture. And it's ungodly. Like it's godly to try. It's godly to the whole the whole perspective of extreme ownership to me just kind of roots out any sense of God as a system of fate and you can't change what's gonna happen and eh, you took responsibility as best you could and it failed. So what are you gonna do? It just is like, no, no, that's there's stuff at stake. You can't have that attitude. Um, and you'll never be successful if you do. So I, I I was finding it pretty helpful just to shine the light in there, get rid of that attitude. Those guys don't have that attitude. No, they and, don't. And, and we have much less reason to have it. I mean, we say we believe in the power of God. We believe that God will help us. We believe in prayer. But I don't know. So, sorry, I'm just going to jump to another book real quick that I did listen to since maybe the last Sanity Shelves. No, I, I may have mentioned it on this show, but Spurgeon's, a book by Spurgeon on pastoring, I can't, or preaching, can't remember its name, but Spurgeon... The Soul Winner? Yeah, thanks. The yeah. Soul Winner. We did talk about it here at some point, maybe? Yes. I, I feel like we I feel have, like we did. It may have even yeah. been a sanity at the movies. I don't remember what the context was at all. But. Maybe. Well, the tie, the tie to extreme ownership is that Spurgeon, he just, he he's like, why do you preach without expecting God to work through you. Like why do well, you Well, yeah, Spurgeon says that over again and over again in The Soul Winner Man. and in uh, lectures to my students. Yeah. It, he'll say things like why would you why would God ever honor your preaching if you didn't expect him to work through it? Yeah. Why would he do that? Yeah. Like why like you become your own worst enemy like if you go to preach without faith that God's going to work through it? Why would God honor that lack of faith in the power of his word? But if you trust God, if you actually believe that his word is powerful and potent, you expect God to work through it, then don't be surprised when he does. In fact, always go with the expectation and the hope that, of course, God's going to work through his word because that's what God does. Like the whole point of the gospel is to save souls. It's what God delights to do. So, of course, he's going to save people. Right. Of course, if there are people there that he has brought to hear the word preached, it's because he means to, to do things. Yeah. It's just such a helpful thing to hear over and over again. I mean, Spurgeon, Spurgeon's great about that. So this book, this book reminds me of that. Well, there you go. It's how, a, how does it remind you of that? Um, it's just the fatalistic link, right? It's like, I can't do any better. I don't know what God's going to do. I don't know what's going to happen. It's like, it's out of my hands. You know, I'm doing, it's like there's a story in extreme ownership of a vice president who's really smart and hardworking and whatever, but he has this plan the plan is not getting implemented by those under him and the board of the company is like, what's going on? Here's this big plan. You came up with it. We're waiting for you to implement it. He's like, well, people won't do it. Like I've done what I can do. I told them about the plan. It's not my fault. And and when he consults with Jocko or, or Leif, whoever it is, they're like, actually, you're not leading. <laughs> you're not leading. Like it is still your fault. It yeah. is still your responsibility. And so, so, so where's, where's the ball getting dropped, right? Like where, right. like if you, if the people underneath you are on board with the plan, well, either you're not communicating it clearly yeah, or it's a bad plan, right? Or you lack the ability fundamentally to get the buy-in, which means you're not the leader for the job. Yeah. You know, so which is it? Like, do you need to resign? Right. Do you need to work harder at your communication? Do you need to improve the plan? Because the people who are implementing in it see fatal flaws in it that you don't see because, and so they can't buy into it because it's a bad plan. Where is the breakdown? There is a breakdown. You have, you can't sit back and throw your hands in the air and say, well, these stupid people, you can't do it. No, I think there's, there's more than one link you could draw between this book and say Spurgeon or a preacher's job. Maybe an easy place would from extreme ownership to draw that line would be the believe chapter. If you don't believe your own mission, why? And that's that's 
you just you can just take take that and and make it a Spurgeon quote almost. If you don't believe that God's going to use you, and you don't believe that preaching is your preaching is going to be effective, well, why do you think God would honor that? Right. Yeah, and that you know that's the thing that he's like, all right, when he's applying it to uh, to the Navy SEALs or mm-hmm. whatever, it's like when the commanding officer does not believe in the orders he's been given. Yeah. It nothing will happen. That's nothing good will happen. He has to believe in it and he has to buy in and he has to find a way to buy in. And it's his responsibility to go back up the chain of command until he understands the orders and can buy into them. So I think the example in that chapter is like the lack of buy in overtaking Iraqi soldiers. Yeah, that's right. Right. That's right. So they, they got this command to take Iraqi soldiers on these, on all of their missions. And it's like, well, they're untrained, they're dangerous. They get in the way. They, they may co- betray us. They may betray us. They cause problems. Like what you've done is consign us to a bunch of hassle and danger and risk that and so it's like I had you know, I had to figure out what these guys aren't stupid. Where did the like there was a breakdown, but I had to take responsibility for the breakdown because if I didn't buy into this, I couldn't get the men to buy into it. So wh- what is it? Why are they why are they doing this? Why are they and the answer is be like you know, I figured it out or I talked to enough people. I don't remember the actual story, but hey, if we don't do the work of training these guys and taking them along and involving them and giving them opportunities to grow, they will never take over this work and we will be stuck here indefinitely. And we have to have some kind of plan and process for handing this work off. And that means we've got to, on every mission, see it as part of the mission, the work of training the locals, the local police force to do the job so mm-hmm. that we can get out of here. And so it may be more short, short-term short risk you know, for each individual mission, but it's for the long-term benefit of the SEALs that we involve and hand off as much of this as we can. So it's just... You know, but you know that's the thing. Is like I have to buy in. I have to find the way to buy in. I have to believe. And once I do that, then I can convince the men because they're following a believer. But they all know if they're following somebody who doesn't believe in the mission. Mm-hmm. And I'm subverting the whole mission. I'm subverting everybody above me if I say, "Well, these are just the orders," and well, it sucks, but you know, let's do it. That's 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 not leadership. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, and those common grace wisdom principles that these guys know and, and implement, they have a mirror in in the work of the church. All over the place. Yeah. Yeah, they do. God is, as a friend of mine used to say to me, God is not a system of fate. You can't treat him like that. Like, if you have faith and if you pray, that makes a difference. Well, and you, you hear pastors uh, speak this way from the pulpit, right? Well, I don't know why God says that yeah. you can't. You know, if it were up to me, you know, homosexuality is not that big of a deal, but, you know, it's God's word. Or I don't know why God says women can't preach mm-hmm. and exercise authority, but, you know, it's like, well, okay, well, you've told everybody you don't believe in the mission and that you don't believe in what you're saying. Mm-hmm. And so nobody's going to believe it. Mm-hmm. And what you've done is you've told them they have your permission to not believe it, right? And so that's just on a top level how we approach God's word, but then there's everything down the line. Well, I don't know why the pastor thought that this was a good idea for this discipleship thing, but I guess we got to do what he says. You know, mm-hmm. it's just like, well, okay. Well, you've you you've consigned this to failure. Like yep. you've decided that this discipleship group is never going to get off the ground, or this Bible study is never going to get off the ground, or this ministry is never going to work because you won't buy into how it's you know how uh, the vision of yourself. You won't do it. You won't do it, so it will not work. It will not work for you. And uh, you have to buy in uh, if you're going to be an effective leader or find a way to buy in. Or go back up the chain and say, I don't buy in, and these are the reasons why, and calibrate until the, there's consensus. Again, just good leadership and good, a very clear understanding of hierarchy, authority, and submission. Mm -hmm. There's a whole chapter that you haven't gotten to yet called leading up and down the chain of command, where it is you're in that position of you, you are both a subordinate and an authority. So how do you deal with living in that tension and in that space? And cool. It's all really excellent. All right. That is a recommended book, Extreme Ownership, Jocko and what's the other guy? Leif Babin. Leif Babin. 
All and right. so is the soul winner. And so is the soul winner. Which yes. Is great. If anyone is great. wanted to read Charles Spurgeon, we recommend it. So what is the next? That's the wrong Something side terrifying. Effect. What is the next book? I hope it's terrifying. Long, boring, life sucking. What else do you have, Ben? Oh, I don't have something long, boring, and life sucking, but I do have I'm reading man, I feel like I've been reading this book forever. I've been <laughs> for no good reason. It's not that long. It's because it's an audio book that I kept forgetting about. Revolutionary Summer by Joseph Ellis, which is about the summer I'm, uh, summer of what, 76? It's when the Continental Congress is meeting and they're drafting the Declaration of Independence. And meanwhile, Washington's army is squaring off against General Howe in New York. And it's just, it's just really cool. I've, I started it so long ago that I don't, I don't remember the first chapters that well. But it's just one of those books that gives you this vibrant sense of all the personalities and all the actual tensions and the like gradual step by step like we have our crazy ideas over here you know i'm thomas jefferson i'm a maverick i have my crazy ideas i'm george washington i'm trying to make the army work I'm not thinking about exactly the same things uh oh i'm thomas jefferson i guess i have to write this declaration of independence thing okay meanwhile no one is like it's the declaration of independence they're like oh good you wrote the thing we asked you to write uh we're going to modify it here and here if Jefferson's really offended. And then no, no one understands, in other words, what they're doing or what's going to work out or what will be the thing that everyone remembers and takes away. And all of these guys are just fighting and arguing like cats and dogs and making political alliances. And of course, some of them are friends and, you know, some of them are not. But man, I, I just find the world of it very fascinating. This is, I, I started listening to this before I saw Hamilton. Hamilton, in my opinion, Hamilton is the kind of thing that inspires you to find out more about these guys, just because mm-hmm. this world is interesting. Um, I don't have much else to say about it. I'm not even done with it. It's not, it's like probably an eight hour audiobook. So who knows why it's taken so long. What's it called again? Revolutionary Summer. I, I have read a couple of other books, maybe just one by this author. He writes all about these guys in this time period. He writes a lot of books. Joseph Ellis, he's really fun. He's fun to read. He's fun to hear, read aloud to you. Just a good writer. And um, he wrote a book called The Quartet about the Federalist Papers and the four guys who wrote them. I can't even remember who all of them are. Hamilton, obviously, is one of them. John Jay. John Jay. Madison, I believe. Yeah, Madison. I don't know. It's good. It's good stuff. I mean, it's all, it's all very interesting. You get long quotes from their letters. You get, you get this world where these guys are walking around like, <clears throat> I'm going to be remembered for hundreds of years, and I want to be remembered the right way. They're just like living out this this theater. Is there a fourth person? There is a fourth person. And I cannot... That book, that book, it's been years. That was an audiobook I listened to with Bob Kaplowitz, actually. Probably something he wanted. According to our friend Wikipedia, it's just Hamilton, Madison, and Jay. That's what I thought. Oh, yeah. Okay, it's also about Washington. So it's not just Federalist Papers. It's like orchestrating the Second American Revolution. There's just a lot about the Federalist Papers in it. So Washington's the other guy, the like the boots on the ground right. of it all. Gotcha. So like fun. I like those kinds of books. It's really fun. It's really fun. Well, I mean, Lincoln is one of my favorite movies just because it, it gets into the like, well, we got to get this thing passed. So what are the alliances we can make? What are the personalities? How can we appeal to this guy's vanity? I just, that kind of stuff is really interesting to see dramatized one way or another. Well, the whole founding of our nation was so touch and go and so much fumbling in the dark by all these pretty brilliant guys who often still didn't know what they were doing. It just, I don't know, how can you not be interested in that as an American? All right, we have two recommended books so far. I I finished Anti-Fragile by Nazim Taleb. Cool. And uh, I don't know, people complain about Taleb being abrasive or arrogant or setting up straw men. I found myself comparing him to Chesterton, like a, a an orthodox Chesterton. So it's like, it is true. He is abrasive. He is arrogant. He does set up straw men here and there. But he's also really delightful and fun. He's a free thinker. He always has something to say on pretty much every page. So he's like, he's just really worth dealing with because he, he he's he's a true intellectual who's also a good writer, hmm. who's also interesting and thoughtful. And it's just like, that's where, it's, to my mind, it's like, I think Chesterton is the best comparison I've been able to come up with for like, like a modern 
instead of Roman Catholic, Orthodox uh, Chesterton, like that that sort of like free thinking out of a little out of left field, but he's got something for you to think about yeah. and chew on on mm-hmm. every page, and, but less uh, less full of uh, weird circumlocutions and cute cuteness. Yes, and much more direct and uh, you know. More acerbic, <laughs> yeah, more acerbic, but in a pretty fun way. <laughs> I think it's fun. Uh, it's it's a turn off to, to to certain people. I think Taleb, almost everything I'm going to talk about, probably everything I'm going to talk about was audiobook. Um, Taleb is one of those guys I want to come back and actually read mm. read properly. Um, and and probably he's more intense reading him than he is listening to him. Although I. Well, I, li- I listened to everything on two and a half uh, on two plus times speed. I probably Taleb I listened to it one at one and a half max because you just have to slow down. It's he's just got yeah, that much. It's, it's too fast. But yeah, it's a lot of fun, and I look forward very much to re- reading everything this dude's ever written. That's that's the plan. Mm. Um, and I've gotten a lot of good feedback, you know, from people who've you know, read to lab because we've talked about him or just been glad that we've talked about him, but cool. Do you have anything else? Or? Uh, I'll do, I'll do another one that Na- just occurred Nathan, to me. Do you have anything? I know that we basically did case for Christian nationalism was, yeah. Was, case for Christian nationalism was kind of mine of recent vintage. And you can hear us talk about that for well over an hour over on the episode that came out before this one, I guess. Uh, I've, just had a baby and uh, most of my reading has actually been booking books. So you can look forward to the book things <laughs> episodes on Cormac MacArthur's passenger, the passenger, which is horrible. I'll just say <laughs> spoilers, spoilers. Man, uh, it's a major spoiler. It is a giant <laughs> steaming pile of garbage. And yet, yeah, it's kind of limp with me. I don't know. Like it's <laughs> no, it, I mean like, I don't know. McCarthy's still McCarthy. He but, is, and his his fatalism has a certain romance to it that you just like. Oh well, uh, I, yeah, I can kind of remember. I, I I don't know how to put it. Like, just the apocalyptic feeling, doom of the book has kind of lingered, even though yeah, I, yeah. I hated every moment I lived in that book, <laughs> and not because of the apocalyptic doom, just because it was a really poorly. It's just a bad book. book. Yeah, yeah. But we'll, well, we can't talk about that now. We'll talk about that <laughs> on the, <laughs> the book. Beginning. I've been reading Anna Karenina, which, of course, if you've not read Anna Karenina, then mm-hmm. that's a must read. You must not read anything else that we talk about today. You must read Anna Karenina. It is the there's a good argument to be made. It's the best work of literature that's been written. Period. I'm not saying that's a winnable argument, but I'm saying there's only a handful of books that you can. Make, make that, that case. And yeah. Anna Karenina and War and Peace are both on that short hmm. list. And so. Yeah. And, and Anna's at the top for yeah. me. I, I haven't read War and Peace. Um, I, I don't know. I think I'm, I finished part one. I'm somewhere in part two of Anna Karenina. Yeah. Listening and that's to coming it? out. No, I, I, I read, read my fiction. Oh. So yeah, I, I, I reread. So I read my fiction usually before bed. And then I listen to it, pretty much anything else, hmm. um, unless it's you know dedicated study, unless it's you know theology or dedicated study, you know for it's like commentaries or whatever for huh. for sermon prep or or something like that. So um, anything that's like remotely uh, fits into the category of philosophy, psychology, anything like that, I'm just. I'm listening to that at two times speed. Yeah. And maybe I'll come back to it. Maybe I'll think wishfully that I'll come back to it and actually devote the time to properly reading something like Taleb down hmm. the line. But I'll push it down the line. I'll listen to all of Taleb. And but probably before I go back and actually read Taleb in paperback or hard copy form, whatever that is, I'll just listen to him again. Because hmm. I just don't have time for that kind of what I do have is a lot of car time or little 10 minute walks after lunch or something like that. What I don't have is a lot of time where I can sit down and dedicate reading time to uh, something that is not for my sermon or to unwind at the end of the day. And I say fiction for unwinding at the end of the day. And so whatever book and book I'm reading, it's on the nightstand and that's when I read it. Well, I think you're doing exactly right. Even from an intellectual standpoint, because 
uh, I think a lot of people probably do the exact opposite because they're like fiction is my light thing. So I listen to that. And then if I want to like learn something and prove myself, I read that and fair enough. But I think fiction is partially atmosphere fiction. You need to sort of be absorbed into the world of it for it to work. And it's not that you can't do that listening to it, but it's, it is easier to do it when you give your absolute full attention. Whereas most books, not so much to lab, but most of the books that we talk about that Jake would listen to, it's like, you're there to get an idea. You're not there to That's right. live in the world. Mm-hmm. No, you're there to glean, yeah. you're there to glean what's to glean. You're there to graze when you need to graze. You can fast forward, you can move back. You're taking thoughts, ideas, you're figuring out what, I mean, it's just like, it's just fodder. You know, and 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 you're following your curiosity here and there, but that's the kind of thing that's just like yeah, not many books uh, are really worth that amount of investment in time, right? And part of part of the investment in fiction is not that um, I'm doing some kind of deep learning, but that there's actual value uh, in just sort of the unwind, relax put myself in somebody else's world for a little while, walk in somebody else's shoes for a while of it all. And I don't have to like the book and I don't have to like the author to have value in that whole experience in and of itself. And then, you know, it helps get me ready for bed and mm. whatever. And that's just a very different kind of, of reading where, you know, some of the books on this list, probably the next one I'm going to throw out there is just like, yeah, okay. Like it's got some helpful insight. Grab it. Hold on to what you can. Don't fret too much about what you can't. I think that's good. Well, mm-hmm. and also there's a lot of vision that you can get from peering through a dirty window if that's what you know that you're doing. Right. And what what I mean by that is I always start with Wikipedia when I learn about a subject. And it's not because I think Wikipedia is always right. It's not because I think Wikipedia is perfect. It's not because I even think that everything's true. But it is just – simply a place where I can make a list of all the other things that I want to go in primary source and learn about. And and in a similar way, when I'm listening to a book, I can actually be very intentional about saying, oh, you know what? I just listened to a part that I need to read. I just listened to a part that I need to go back and and give another pass to. Let's let's not, you know, it's not like this, this, this all or nothing sort of, well, I just did my first pass and it was kind of shallow and there's, I I can't do anything else. It turns out I can get a physical copy of the book or get it on Kindle and actually look at the words and absorb them. I just have to be proactive enough, make a little note. I mean, a lot of times I'll just jot down a phrase just so that I can like yeah. then search for that phrase on on uh, on Kindle. Um, I mean, that's how I do things. So it's like I, I want to go deep here and here and here. I'm not going to do it while I'm driving in my car, but I am going to learn that I should go deep while. Yeah, and mm-hmm. so you know you're you're driving and at that moment it's like okay like i you've got a couple of choices and the, it, at least i do it's like okay if i don't pause right here will i remember to bookmark this and come back to it and how much does it matter and you you just kind of like making those calculations and it's like sometimes i'll just pause and get where i'm going and then i'll make my note I need to come back to that thought because I just don't want to lose that thought or that idea or come back and circle that circle back around that. Sometimes I'd be like, well, I might not be getting where I'm going for another half an hour and it's not that important. I'm just going to keep going. And if it comes back, it comes back. And if it doesn't, who cares? And sometimes it's like, well, I might not be going, getting somewhere for another half hour and I really want to keep going. So guess what I'm going to do? I'm going to pull off into this gas station. I'm going to make my stupid note and then I'm going to get back on the road. You know, just whatever. You're making your calculations. It is what it is, but you're just working on the thought, the idea, the concept, you know, whatever it is that you find interesting, insightful, helpful, that's going to help you grow intellectually, practically, functionally, as a husband, as a father, as a pastor, as a leader, as a businessman, as a uh, an artist, as, as an athlete as whatever it is, whatever it is, as a scientist, you know, whatever it is that you're reading or listening to, just make it work. You make it functional. And this is like basic 101 stuff about how to read a book. This is like what Mortimer Adler's book, How to Read a Book, teaches you is 
yo, it is useless. It is not it's uh, books are not some kind of pristine artifact that you, you know, worship. Like what matters is the degree to which you're having a conversation with the author and that you're learning from them and that you're engaging with them and that you're questioning them and that you're figuring out what you actually believe in. Uh, having them challenge or shape or reshape your understanding of the world or yourself or people or God, you know, depending on on what you're facing. So it's just like, hey, hit up against it, hit up against it, stick, move, keep moving, um, but keep working. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Amen to that. I would say, so just to go back real quick to fiction, I, I listened to Anna Karenina, read by a woman, Pavirin Valansky, Valahansky yeah. translation. Yeah. I found it I found it pretty easy just to be absorbed. Mm-hmm. It's such a good book that almost whatever I was doing, driving, walking, um, it just would just, yeah. just pull me. It would like it would create that atmosphere, you know. Yeah, well, I, I think I think, I think that can happen. That. It can um, happen and it really depends on your reader. I think, lot, I, I think right? it does. Huh. Well, Tolstoy is actually a really good example. I've never tried to listen to Tolstoy because he's so dense and he's so full of wisdom and little nuggets and things that mm-hmm. I want to underline and remember. I, I, at this time, just because I feel like I'm under a time crunch, I have been listening to that. I'm sure that exact huh. one. Cause I think there's only one reader of, of Pever- that of translation. Pever- Pever- That's what I remember. Yeah. 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 And she's I quite looked. good. She's quite good. And so I'm just constantly wanting to make a little notes in my eye note hmm. thing that it's just like a scattered phrase or a, right. you know, it did barely make sense. It'll be like ice pond skates, this <laughs> and then i'll know if i google that i can figure out you can like, find it uh, that was the most brilliant insight into the human soul that i've ever read but i wouldn't okay. have time to sort of live there yeah but uh we're well doing... it's it's different too if you're you're making a podcast right yeah you want it, you want to and i was i didn't have that burden at all right so it's simpler for me just to listen but i could see the value in reading it of course i mean it's brilliant yeah i mean i i read very little these days just uh yeah, I just don't have the time or the attention. I listen, um, so I try to make listening work for me by having strategies like that that mm. allow me to go a little deeper. Because I am sympathetic to you know we've we've talked about this a million times and said go ahead just listen make it easy and people will come back and say well yeah but the full attention that you give when you read it really is a little bit different isn't it and it is and yeah. it is yeah sure of course but you just got to figure out what works um, well the problem that people will get stuck in. And this is the problem that I think we're circling around addressing is that uh, idealistic view of giving your full attention or the need to finish what you start before you move on to something else <laughs> right. will just handicap you and keep you from ever making forward progress. Yes. And so it is just much, I have found, I've lived in that space a lot in my life and I found it it's much more practical to take a pragmatic approach and be like, mm-hmm. you know, the, it, the the good may be the enemy of the best, but the good is much better than the undone ideal. Mm-hmm. And so, yeah. I, I think best is the yeah. enemy of done. Is, is right? Is, is, it's 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 one of my personal mottos. <laughs> and good I, and is the enemy of the best, but the but the best is the enemy of done. And then maybe that's a very self defeating. You know, maybe Jocko wouldn't like that motto very much, but. Uh, you know what's worse is not done. Not done is death. Not done is loss of job. Not done is <laughs> yeah. Not done is bad. Um, and so you have to figure. It, it's not that you always make compromises with everything in your life. It's just that you figure out how to be strategic about where you want to make the compromises. What needs to be best and what needs to be done. And you just got to be smart and self aware about that kind of stuff. And I think that's. That's all we're really saying is, of, of course, there's some books that you just have to read or some sections from certain books that you have to read or places where you need to make notes in them. Like, they're all tools. You just have to pick mm-hmm. the and, right and, one. And, and we're telling you as we go through what we think are the books that are actually worth reading. Right. Like, I don't think that extreme ownership is worth reading. I think it's worth listening to. Yeah. And I think it's worth yeah, listening definitely. to a couple of times if you want to. That's fine. Uh, anti-fragile. That's worth reading, right? But if you're not going to take the time to read it, better listen to and half absorbed than never read. Well, also the one thing that yeah. we haven't said is some you know people are different. People 
absorptive information differently and at different speeds and at different rates and in different ways. You might be somebody that can actually get a lot out of listening. You might be somebody that's just defeated by listening. Your attention immediately wanders. You might be somebody who has to read. Uh, People are different. So you really have to find what works for you. Yeah. So next book or no, I was going to say, well, here's, here's three books, but they're not all, they're not recent necessarily. I, on car trips, my wife and I have listened to several of the Lord Peter Whimsy Mysteries by Dorothy Sayers. Ah, oh, yes. Friend of the Inklings. Friend of the Inklings and friend to modern conservative Christianity is my understanding, but yeah. I've never read her. Yep. Well, the, I'm not a mystery reader. I'm not, I, this is not a thing for me, but uh, me man. Too, me too. I hate mysteries. But man, these are, these are so much fun. I, um, for one thing, she's an actual pro stylist which helps a lot. She just writes writes about everything well. Her character, Lord Peter Whimsey, is this, this interesting aristocrat, just a really eccentric guy who solves mysteries, and he is a ton of fun. She's great at dialogue. She's great at all the characters. He has a great relationship with his servant, his manservant, Bunter. Um, his mother is really funny. So it's, it's all these different class sort of clashes that Lord Peter navigates by being self-consciously eccentric. And unselfconsciously eccentric. And yeah. so it, it's just got all of this stuff going on that's so much fun to read about. I don't know what else to say. She's, her plotting is clever. The mysteries are clever. Um, but that's what a good mystery should be, is a clothesline to hang little character vignettes and things oh, on. Man. And where, that's what this is. And, and, just, and good prose, whereas some people like to read old <laughs> Agatha Christie. Oh, I'm, I'm, getting, I'm getting myself embroiled Where here. she's just like, hey, it's a clothesline. <laughs> Didn't bother hanging anything on it, but you can follow it all the way to the end of the clothesline, and boy, won't it be surprising. And people <laughs> love that, and that's fine. I'm glad that they do, but man, do I think <laughs> no, it's... No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I sense some hostility here. Well, I'm I... hostile because the whole world's like, yay, we just like narrative. And I'm like, I like narrative too, but I like other things. I, I don't More have ingredients. A, I don't have a comment on that. I, I can just say... Dorothy Sayers is super fun. She's a great writer. Whimsy is one of my favorite characters, period. And and it's 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 a good time at the movies to listen to one of these in the car. And and she's clever. She's clever. The plot of the last one we listened to, what it clouds of witness, it was really clever. It was a lot of fun. I think, if I may, that you're actually even more like me than oh, yeah? I'm, I'm like me. Because what you like is sci-fi books that are essentially <laughs> plotless hey, but that's not true i mean i do too but that's but but it but it's just the plot is the world it is it's like hey let me spend 500 pages just developing well a world i mean i i like that too but i also like plot heavy i mean okay all right i'll cop to this i listened to we've talked about this guy alf mike brandon sanderson sure big time sci-fi hot shot author sci-fi fantasy but but he's and also his, a world builder. is he the guy that finished out uh wheel, wheel of time, time? Yes. he is yes 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 he, he's uh, he's actually i mean he's not great he, but he's pretty good at dialogue he's pretty good at he's characters a, he's, a, he's okay at all that he's mediocre at prose but he's um he is a plot heavy dude like he's ingenious with plots yes like that's what he does he builds systems of magic and he builds plots and they're but, like but, machines his but there's plots. guys that are just plot that right. I don't think you would like as much. I mean, I, don't know. I, I believe I believe it. I'm uh, sure that's right. Um, I, what, I think, like Isaac Asimov or something. Sure, I used yeah. to read him as a kid. Yeah, wouldn't go back. Yeah, I don't think I think Jake is the guy who has the most narrative lust in of the three of us. This huh. has been a long established truism on the bookening. Jake yep. just likes a good story for a good story's sake, and I think everybody does. It's not like I don't, or Ben, <laughs> <laughs> except those people who read Agatha Christie. No, they like a a bad story. For they like a bad story. Uh, you hey know. man, you're hitting my family. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know. I'm hitting everybody's family because everybody loves Agatha Christie. It's just me all I alone. Don't, in I the feel cold like in I, the dark. I haven't given Agatha Christie a fair shake. What have I? And then there were none. Is the only one I've read. I didn't like it, but I like Perot as a character. I like Perot stories. I think so. Does that put me now? I like her more than you, basically. If I like Perot, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah. Just. I just want to. I'm just not that intrigued by I like David trying Suchet to solve as the Perot. mystery. Yes, I like David Suchet as Perot, but Dave, he's Is doing it? things that, and they're writing things for him that Christy never wrote. Okay. Well. I mean, I'd rather watch a Kenneth Branagh Perot than read one of those books. Okay, shots hmm. fired. I'm sorry. All right. Perot's great. Agatha Christie's great. 
I'm uh, I'm being acerbic like Taleb because it's more entertaining. <laughs> That's but right. Here's the fact. <laughs> the fact is, different strokes for different folks. It's totally cool uh-huh. if you like Agatha Christie. I've just never been able to enter into that. Whatever whatever that is. Whatever Andy it is. Thinks you're stupid. No, I don't. I don't think you're stupid. I think you're very smart. I think there's probably people who are way smarter than me. Totally detached from any kind of empathy or emotional need, <laughs> and uh, you know they just want a, a puzzle box. And Agatha Christie satisfies their their puzzle lust. And if if you're a a, a puzzle lustful person, then enjoy your little trinket. I'll be over here reading my Tolstoy. So I think I've said that in a fair way that's inclusive of everybody. Yep, nailed it. Nailed it. All right, next book. Uh, I read uh, Influenced by Robert Cialdini. I, I had this book in Audible for a long time, and I started it and couldn't get through the introduction and thought it was going to be a horrible dry book, but it was really highly recommended across the board. So it kind of lived there, and I almost like returned it. And one day I was like out of credits and out of books, and so I hit play and got through the introduction into the first chapter. And uh, it's really, really great. And probably one of the most insightful books uh, you can read if you want to arm yourself against the influence tactics of media, hmm. of false teachers, of salesmen, of anything like that, like um, more so than what uh, what's the uh, more so than like Chris Voss or hmm. anything like that. This is the foundational psychological work, interestingly and compellingly presented. So it's just just skip skip Scott Adams, skip uh, Voss read influenced by robert cialdini and you'll mm. get the straight dope with the psychological studies but also good stories and really worthwhile i think if you want to arm yourself against that sort of thing and also but be careful like you can use uh the tools you can use the book to arm yourself against you know tactics to m- manipulate you i think there are some ways you can use certain tactics in an honest and truthful way. And you can also use the tactics to manipulate people and become a master of that sort of thing if you get good at it. So it's, it's got its dangers, but it's helpful. And he, and he's, I think, you know, maybe he's using his influence tactics on me, but he does a good job of just, I think being just a pretty good, honest, straight ahead dude about this sort of thing. Hmm. So I really enjoyed that book and I think it's worthwhile. Um, cool. Do we have more, or should I just keep working through my list here? Because I got a lot. <laughs> uh, <laughs> keep going. You know what? Let's come back for part two. I think right. that, I think that might be smart. So uh, the, the big takeaways from this uh, uh, podcast are: read uh, extreme ownership, read anti fragile, read anti-fragile? influence, read influence. Read Lord Peter Wimsey, read Anna Karenina. Do not read that Cormac McCarthy book, but do listen to the bookening Tear It Apart. We've not yet recorded or released that episode, but it's coming sometime December. Lord willing, read Agatha Christie if you want to. And just Joseph Ellis. Joseph Ellis. Is pretty fun, just, at least according to Ben. He is, yes. I like that the caveat there. At least yeah, according, according to Ben. To ben. Right. <laughs> Thanks, Jake. Well, <laughs> influence he, is pretty good, at least according to Jake. He, each one of these is, yeah. <laughs> is caveated by our own, except Ben and I now are both on extreme ownership and to love. Right? Yeah. right. And yeah, I'd so. say my opinions on Agatha Christie are really just me expressing the soul of the podcast. And yeah, like, you guys wrote that for me. That was like just a script that I performed. Right. So that's right. That's the big twist. That's <laughs> the big the twist. <laughs> did you see it coming? You probably did. Cause you, you like to caveats. solve your little mysteries. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Agatha Christie. Give me a break, people. You can do better than that. No, 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 you can't. She's great. She's the most popular author after the authors of the Bible. Isn't she the second bestseller after? Yeah. Yeah. And there's like a, her and Shakespeare and the Bible. Yeah. That's it. And there's a reason for that. <sighs> All right. Until next time. Stay sane. Oh, and just go to warhornmedia.com forward slash give to give. And go to patreon.com forward slash sound of sanity to give in a different way. And yes, do stay, do stay sane.